listener production. Welcome to the Motorsport Brief. I'm back after a break. Good timing. It's race week in Tassie for supercars and a key member of their broadcast team has come back on for a preview. G'day everybody, Rusty here for another edition of the Shortcast. Garth Tander is standing by to talk Simmons Plains, Enduros, Silly Season and more. We've released a whole bunch of episodes in the past month too. Feature eps with Alistair McRae, son of the legendary British Rally Championship star Jimmy McRae and brother of the late Colin McRae. Al's own story is excellent, including his son now, Max McRae, taking on Europe, rallying over there and seemingly on the same path, and some recollections of the weapon, the ex-possum-born WRX that Alistair has driven too. That's a nice one. There is a two-parter in there with Calvin Fish as well. Now, if you don't immediately recognise the name, let me tempt you to listen. Commentator for IMSA Sports Cars in America. You'll know him as the expert voice alongside Lee Diffie at the Le Mans 24-hour over the years and the Daytona 24 too. But Calvin's junior career saw him race alongside Etten Senna and Martin Brundle. Some awesome backstories in that one, including playing Space Invaders, or Galaga, I think it was, against Senna, and how it was a window into Senna's competitive side. Let's get straight to GT. We haven't spoken to him for a while. He will be on the mic for the Ned Whiskey Tasmania Super Sprint this weekend on Fox Sports and Sky in New Zealand, and not long before he pulls that helmet back on for the Enduros with Penrite Racing. Hello, mate. Welcome back to the garage. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me back on. Fittingly, we find you sitting in a car. Where the heck are you in the world? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, it's the lifestyles of the glamorous at the moment. So uh, everyone's, oh, supercars, you know, especially you work in TV. It must be glamorous lifestyle. Um, this week, I'm on the uh, supercars, you know, supercars tour through regional Victoria with Aaron Noonan. And he's, he's got this program going with, three, with Hino. Um, that we are doing three sportsmen's nights through regional Victoria. So we did Sale in eastern Victoria, uh, Bendigo, and uh, and Ballarat all this week in the lead-up to, to Tassie coming up this weekend for Super Cup. Literally on tour and with your commentary colleague, Neil Crompton. There would have been some great old stories there, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, we had, um, had Neil join us uh, in Bendigo, uh, which was fun because... Um, uh, as you know, Rusty, what you've got to do is you've got to strike early, and and if you're going to give each other a hard time, you've got to get in first. So he was actually, it was random. We got called out onto the stage. Aaron brought us out on stage, and Neil couldn't get the microphone working, and he literally couldn't figure out how to turn it on. I was like, "Come on, all geez, these years, you've been, in this, you've been in this broadcasting game for a little while now. Surely you know how to turn a microphone on." So that's what I opened with, and the punters loved it, and away we went. Excellent stuff. They're uh, they're great, those nights. And if people listening haven't been to them before, I'm sure Aaron will do some more um, as the, the season and even next year goes on, get a, get amongst it. Observations from you, if we can, of the season so far. So, I mean, obviously, uh, losing your, your Bathurst winning um, co-driver in SVG to the United States. But I think as, as Chad Nalon said to me um, offline recently, it, it's been like this arrival of the new wave of, of youngsters. Do you feel like that and that there's been some good stories there? Oh, yeah, there's clearly been some good stories. Obviously, at the start of the year when Will Brown jumped from Erebus to Red Bull Triple Eight. Um, everyone was like, oh, gee, how's Will going to go there? You know, different team, different environment to Erebus. And Brock Feeney's obviously been there a couple of years and it's sort of his team. And so Will turned up, stuck it on pole at the very first race meeting and sort of marked his intentions from there. And um, so at the start of the year, we saw this great battle between the two Red Bull guys in Brock and Will. And it was sort of seemed like, wow, no one's going to catch these two. It's like they're going to win the championships just by how much. But as the years progressed, they, they've been very un eight. And and have haven't they've had a couple of weekends in a row where performance hasn't been what we'd expect from them. And Chaz Mostert and Walkinshaw and Andretti United have sort of come on strong. And Cam Waters started disastrously, but he's been super fast. And then the emergence of Matty Payne. So there's been lots of storylines throughout the year. And, and sort of as we sit here, one round to go prior to the endurance races, there's a lot of chat about can Red Bull hang on? Is the Chaz threat real? Can Chaz Mostert bounce back. Can Matt Payne win more races? Is there anyone else that's going to come out of the pack? Nick Burkett at Matt Stone Racing has been very strong. 
So there's been heaps of, I mean, you know, in the TV world, there's been heaps to talk about because it's, there's plenty of players in the game. Can I pick up on two things that you said there? Uh, firstly, the likelihood that Matt Payne can can deliver more. I mean, I thought he's done um, so far some some brilliant things there. And and then um, the Mostert and WAU thing, I think, seems real. They're going to be good in the back end of this year, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're, 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 they've been absolutely real. They've had a couple of rounds, though, like Darwin, for example, mm-hmm. on the super soft tyre, where they came off the back of Perth and absolutely blitzed everyone and speed wise so you'd expect oh wow they're going to go to darwin and be strong but on the super soft tire they they were nowhere like Chaz qualified outside the top 20 in both races recovered pretty well in the races but didn't have the one lap speed and we go to tassie this weekend on the super soft tire and if you don't qualify if you qualify outside the top 20 you're not going to get yourself back in the game at tassie such Mm. a important factor qualifying strongly so is it real We'll find out at Tassie this weekend. Um, And I was actually asked in the broadcast at Sydney, can they win the championship? Um, On speed, yes. I think they have the speed to win the championship. But when it comes down to, you know, real championship battle, like real hardcore, you know, going at it, grinding it out, and and it becomes not just a game on track, it becomes a game off track with with the head games and the, and the teams getting involved about executing pit stops and just executing under pressure. You've got to remember, Triple Eight have been doing that year in, year out for the last 15 years. And the last time that the Walkinshaw group won a championship was when I won in 2007. So yeah. it's been a long time since they've been in that championship hunt and been championship hardened. So on speed, yes, they can win. But can they do it when the pressure's really on as a team unit? We'll find out. One of five events to go, as you say, last stop before the Enduros. Garth, I can't throw stones because I'm talking to you from New Zealand, but it is going to be cold there. There is, <laughs> I think, I think. I mean, it starts around six or seven degrees in the morning, but the Bureau says highs of maybe 18 degrees. And did I see that there is the chance of some showers too? Is that right? Yeah, there's there's some chance, particularly on the Friday. So we've only got the one half hour practice session on Friday, and then there's another practice session Saturday morning. So the highest chance of rain is Friday, which the teams, you know, They'll run in the wet if it's wet mm. because it is Simmons Plains and the weather is fickle down there and it does blow in very, very quickly. So if there's Saturday, they're saying there's about a 60% chance of one to five mil of rain. Uh, so that could be in Tasmania, particularly at Simmons Plains, 100% chance of 10 mil of rain or 100% <laughs> chance of no no rain whatsoever because it is literally on a plane down there. You know what it's like, Rusty? Mm. It's in the middle of this big, flat land mass. So the weather can blow in pretty quickly. Um, it, it will actually, you said it's going to be cold. It's actually not going to be as cold as everyone sort of thought it might thought be. It might so be. if it's six, mm. 16, 17 degrees, as long as it's not blowing a gale, it, it'll mm. actually be quite pleasant. Yep. We've had a little, little giggle there, but in, in real terms, mate, it's a fantastic bull ring. The fans uh, turn up in droves because a bit like New Zealand, they, they love it down there. You've talked about um, tyre for the weekend and so on. What about a couple of little other things that fans need to be mindful of around um, Simmons Plains? And I think you know Craig Lowndes talked in his column uh, for Supercars this week about um, you know timing from the team around um, you know people on track at the key moments of qualifying and racing and so on. Yeah, look, it's it's a challenging place. Like you, you opened saying how well the race, the event is supported, and it is really well supported in Tasmania. Mm. And these. These events like New Zealand, like Tasmania, like Darwin, like Perth, because we only get to those sort of far further away destinations once a year, they're, they're, well, they're well supported. It's, it's Tasmania's biggest sporting event of the year when supercars come to town. So um, there's always great support down there. Um, the track itself, everyone sort of looks at it and goes, oh, it's short, oh, it needs to be longer, there's only three or four real corners. But I like that about it. I like the mm. fact that it's so challenging. There's only really three corners at Simmons Plains. There's three very different types of corners. Um, and because it is a short lap and the lap time's ra- around the 51 second mark, you have to get those three corners absolutely perfect. And if you don't get it right, you get penalized heavily because the times are so close. So if you make a small mistake at the hairpin at turn four, for example, and lose a tenth of a second, that's the difference between qualifying second and qualifying 14th. So you get massively penalised if you don't get it right. So I like the challenge of that at Simmons Plains. Uh, one of the real challenges this weekend, even though it is, we did say 16, 17 degrees, 
it's going to be tire temperature in qualifying. So it's going to be about making sure you got the right tire temperature, particularly the front tire, at the right with the right track position. So getting yourself in the right position, and, and that's probably a little bit about what Craig was talking about in his column about the timing side of things. Mm. It's lining up your car position on track, the time left to go in the session, the tire temperature being right where it needs to be, and then maximizing that opportunity in the session because qualifying is so important. So I love it. It's high intensity racing. Uh, there's not a lot of tire degradation, so you can drive the car really hard all the way through the race. So that means that it's the drivers make more mistakes. So it's it's always something going on at Taddy. It's always really exciting. Final stop before you jump back behind the wheel too. You're looking forward to Sandown and Bathurst. We touched on Matt Payne there before Clifford, as the team now call him. He just he just keeps getting better, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He's um, doing a really good job. He um, he's got a huge amount of natural talent. Uh, he's got a very 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 impressive feel for the car, and he's a very different. You mentioned Shane Van Gisbergen. Um, who I used to drive with. Um, he's a very different character to Shane, but he's got very similar traits in his feel for the car. Okay. And his, um, he's got this innate feel of what the tyre is doing and how the tyre is reacting under the, underneath him, if you like. And, and Shane was very similar like that. It's something that you can't really teach. It's something that you can't really feel or learn. It's just something that you have. And, and Matt's very similar to Shane in that respect. That's probably the only similarity to Shane in that respect. They're very different, char- <laughs> very very different characters. Um, but Matt's doing a very good job, um, and he's also learning this year how much work you have to do outside of the car, because mm. you know he's been very successful in karting. He's been very successful in all the junior categories in the run up to supercars. But when you get to supercars, there's 24 drivers and there's 24 champions. They've all had success on the way up. So when you're racing in the junior categories, there's only three or four drivers that you really have to race against. Um, but in the in the main game, everyone's had success. That's why they're in the main game. So he's just now starting to realise how much work you have to put in prior to the event, how much preparation you need to do. And I think that says we're now seeing as a result of the work that he's learning that he has to do through this year as he gets better at that, the performances are starting to become stronger and stronger on track as well, which is good news for me, Rusty. Absolutely. I mean, are you enjoying all that still? And and do you sort of feel a bit like Craig that you'll just keep going uh, in an endurance mode as 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 long as you enjoy it, or do you have in the back of your mind a a plan of other things you would you would like to do before it gets too far down the track? Oh, I don't. Um, I don't really have a timeline set on the driving thing. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll keep driving as long as the team finds that I'm beneficial. Um, from an engineering point of view, from a leadership point of view, particularly within the team going forward with, you know, Matt this year only being 21 and and then next year with Kai Allen joining the team who's only just 18. So, um, you know, if they feel that there's some benefit with me driving-wise, um, with my experience, then I'll keep doing it as long as, I'm, one, I'm fast and two, I'm enjoying it, three, I'm beneficial. Um, but then also I, I'm doing more and more stuff in the background with Grove Racing or Penright Racing as well. So, um, so the driving aspect of what I do with the team now is, is actually probably the smaller aspect of what gotcha. I do. And so I'm enjoying, I enjoy driving the cars, still enjoy the challenge of jumping into the test day and trying to beat the main game guys and being faster than them straight away. So still got a bit of a few competitive bones in my body, mate. Good. The Kai Allen thing was a huge coup. As you say, a lot of talent uh, coming in at a young age. What's the kind of thing you reckon he needs to do over the next six months or so just to prep himself for that, that big step? Yeah, look, it's a big step, you know, from the from the Dunlop series to, to the main game, and and anyone that's made that jump in the past is really, I don't know if underestimated the jump, but has really just not expected the level of intensity mm. that's in the main game, and you could be racing for twenty second in the main game, and it's the hardest race of your life ever. Um, so, just just you know, for him, just understanding that, um, you know, I mentioned before. No, Kai's had a lot of success in the in the junior categories, in the in the Dunlop Super Three category when he first started in a supercar, and then obviously won the Dunlop Super Two Championship and is leading the Super Two Championship this year. But in realistic terms, there's only six six seven cars to you compete against, and that was what I was talking about earlier in those junior categories. So the intensity is not, you know, a bad day in the Dunlop series is you qualify eight. Hmm. A bad day in the main game is you qualify last. So that's a big difference. So it's a big difference mentally getting your head around that. 
Um, so it's more the mental preparation. It's more just the understanding and respecting the championship before you get there. But Kai's an impressive young man. Uh, I've spent a bit of time with him in the past um, and and in since the announcement. And um, his head's, you know, very, very firmly screwed on his shoulders. He, um, he knows what challenge he, ha- he has again ahead of him. He also understands that, you know, if he's successful this year in the Dunlop series, he'll be the only back-to-back Dunlop series champion. So that puts a little, you know, even though you're a rookie coming into the main game next year, the main game guys will not make it easy for him. Mm. So he also respects that that's going to be a challenge. So um, that's the work that that will happen over the summer break. You know, he's still got to deliver. He's got to go and he's driving for the opposition at Sandown and Bathurst. He's driving for <laughs> Shelby Power Racing. Uh, he's still got his Dunlop Series Championship in the final round of that is at Adelaide. And um, and once all that's locked away, then we'll look to start to ramp up his preparations ahead of next year's championship. We'll sneak a quick break here on Rusty's Garage. More with Garth Tander in just a few moments. For this ep of the shortcast, we're joined by Supercars commentator and five-time Bathurst 1000 winner Garth Tander with the Enduros just around the corner. Can he add a sixth title to that tally? Solid chance in that Penrite Racing Mustang with Matt Payne. Let's get back to the convo now. A couple of listeners asking just about uh, engine performance, Ford uh, v Chev. From what you've observed with all that hard work that's gone in from supercars and so on, do you feel like that's that's closer, that's better? Oh, it's really hard to, to judge from the outside, um, Rusty, because, mm. you know, some weekends you look at it and you go, oh, yeah, it looks, it looks really, really close. And some weekends you look at it and, and it, it's one way or the other whether you're at Chev or, or it's Ford. And so the work that, that supercars are doing at the moment on the AVL transient dyno in the US um, is world's best practice. So we saw, you know, I think that the work that the, that the category did over the summer break last year in the wind tunnel looks to have fixed any aero issues between the two cars. And the same will be true of the engines once this dyno testing is done. I mean, I actually last year when I was watching the championship before I actually raced in the championship at Sandown. I thought, oh, it actually doesn't look that bad, the Ford thing. And then I jumped in the car and lap four up the back straight at Sandown. I was like, holy smokes, the Ford engine's okay. a long way behind the Chev engine. Mm-hmm. So you don't really know until you're in it. So it's hard for me. But, um, you know, we're, we're hearing less and less about the engine thing. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's generally a pretty good indicator of, you know, the guys that are driving them week in, week out are speaking less about it. And that's a pretty good indicator. Lots to play out in terms of the driver market, the silly season um, too, mate. I think that'll be uh, you know a lot of conversations around that between now and, and the end of the year. I would like, in a in a kind of uh, fan sense, to think that Richie Stanaway might find a seat when the music stops. Do you think that he can? And and um, what do, what do you reckon there? Yeah, well, I hope so. I, I certainly hope so. You know, there's been a lot of chat since the announcement that Richie and. Penrite Racing won't be together next year, that he wasn't given a fair chance and, and all the rest of it. But Richie knew going in that it was only a 12-month deal um, and, and it just hasn't worked and it's not hasn't been results-based. It's just been, you know, the, the, the relationship, the gelling of parties, you know, the, the driver-team relationship just hasn't gelled. Mm-hmm. So um, that doesn't mean that it won't gel somewhere else. Or else and, yeah. and certainly the, the, the um, position from the team, I know, with Richie was that, you know, although we're not going to be working together in 2025, we would love nothing more for you to have success in the remainder of 2024 to give you the best opportunity for next year to get yourself a seat, hopefully full time, um, but even in a co-driver role going forward. So, uh, look, I, I hope that he does land on the grid in some capacity. There's a huge amount of talent in there. I, you can see it in the data, mm. but for whatever reason, it, it just hasn't come out this year. Um, so yeah, look for, for for me personally, I I'd love to see Richie racing. Um, it just hasn't worked out at Penrite Racing, um, but that's not to say it won't it won't work somewhere else. Let's hustle through the final few here. Been broadcasting for a while now and doing a, a terrific job of that with Supercast TV. Um, how, how are you finding it there? And did you enjoy um, doing the kind of expert role in the Bathurst 12 hour alongside Richard Crail? I, I thought you flew there and that that combination was awesome. That was a, a little addition to the CV. Yeah, look, I, I really do enjoy the broadcast stuff. Um, I, I still very much feel like I'm the apprentice kid in the broadcast world. And, um, and that's, I'm mindful of the fact that I'm not a broadcaster. 
I didn't grow up going to, to any media school. I've done no formal media training. So I am not, I'm not, I'm not you, Rusty. I don't have that formal background and, and I don't, so therefore I don't try and be that type of broadcaster. I'm very much a driver that gives his opinion of someone that's been in the paddock for 25, 26 years. Um, so from that point of view, I really enjoy it. Uh, I, I try and stay relaxed and, and just, and just don't get too wound up about it all. And, um, and the feedback that I get is that it, it comes across that way, which, which is nice to hear. Uh, so yes, I do enjoy it. Uh, the 12 hour stuff, um, is great. And, and, and I treat that, treat it like laps. It's like, it's like when you're a race car driver, the more laps you do, the better you are. Right. Yep. So what better way of getting more laps? than doing a 12-hour race, doing a 12-hour <laughs> stint. So so sitting with um, with Richard Crail and John Hindolf from um, Radio Le Mans for 12 hours um, is really cool. And obviously, I've driven those cars quite a bit, the GD3 cars that race at the Bathurst 12-hour. I've driven them a lot. And um, so I've, I've got a lot of experience with those cars and that race. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good laps, Rusty. It's good testing. And good preparation for, for just any opportunity that you get to sit in the comms box. Keep being you because that comes through and it sounds terrific. Karting with family. How's all that going? <laughs> Busy. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, um, I sort of really now retrospectively respect what my parents did for me. Um, yeah, <laughs> we, do, we do a lot of um, a lot of a lot of racing. The kids really enjoy it. Um, uh, I enjoy it. And look. People sort of say, oh, you know, does he want to be do the kids? And both my kids, my daughter, Scarlett, and my son, Sebastian, they both race. And they, oh, is there, you know, is either I'm going to be a supercar driver or go to Formula One? And that's not the grand plan. That, the, that's certainly not the grand plan. The reason we started karting and still remains to this day is that I still have very fond memories as a teenager spending my weekends with my parents. Cool. And that was a way karting. So, you know, rather than being off partying or hanging out with your mates at the shopping centre or, you know, just generally being a troublemaker somewhere, um, I was with my parents, spending time doing what I obviously loved, karting. But, um, and so I wanted to try and replicate that with my kids. And, um, like, my 13-year-old daughter, Scarlett, she's 13 going on 25. So um, <laughs> she... I know. Don't worry, I know. <laughs> she, you, you, you've seen her in action. So... Um, she, you know, spending the time in the car with her driving to the track, whether it's a country race or, or hanging out at the racetrack in the car trailer in between races, um, is really, really special time. And if they're having a great time on the racetrack or they're having a great time at the track with their friends as well, um, that's just a benefit. So, um, karting teach you, any motorsport teaches you a huge amount of resilience because you have more bad, more bad days than good days, teaches you have to work hard, teaches you a lot of things other than driving fast. Um, so that's that's the stuff that we go karting for. It's not so much that, you know, one day they want to be, well, mm. Sebastian wants to be the next Shane Van Gisbergen. He's not that interested in being in the next bout tender. Pers- perspective. I-, I love it. Great bonding time for you. Let's finish with SVG. Have you been keeping an eye on him? What do you reckon? He's uh, going yeah, yeah. super well there, isn't he? <laughs> I watch, watch some of his races. When he crashes, I tell him he's useless. When he wins, I tell him he's going okay. Um, so we still have a lot of banter over text. Um Oh, look, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I am not surprised that he's going as well as he mm. is because, you know, I was fortunate enough to be very quite close to him for three or four years, um, as a, as a teammate. Uh, yeah, does doing a really good job, particularly on the ovals. I mean, you think about a lot of the ovals that he turns up to. One, never, dri- never seen the joint, let alone driven it. Some of the races this year have been washed out in practice. So the first time he either drives the car is in qualifying. Sometimes qualifying has been dried out or washed out, and the first time he drives a car on the track he's never seen before is in the race, and he's still troubling the top ten in the Xfinity series. So, pretty impressive. And everything you read about the people that you know, are in NASCAR, are heavily impressed about what he's doing. So, um, you know, he hasn't said anything to me officially, but certainly hope that he can stitch together a main game, you know, a, a, a cup ride next year full time. And you think about, you know probably just over 12 months ago it was just that one-off race at chicago to where he is now being in a conversation to being in the main game full time pretty impressive rise very impressive on his work there but we hope it's just as impressive for you behind the wheel for the enduros keep giving him heaps go well behind the wheel at sandown and at the mountain and give those broadcast colleagues of yours plenty of stick this weekend enjoy the apple island thank you for chatting to us today cheers rusty 
He is fantastic, isn't he? Great currency that he brings to the coverage. And having dealt with him for years now, I promise you that it's the same Garth Tander on camera, on television, that you get in a pod chat like that or one of those fantastic nights for fans that the sleuth, Noons, has organised over time, or even if you meet Garth Trackside, as I know many of you have done. Before we go, I'm off to the Singapore Grand Prix again next month, so we'll aim to get some pods turned around for you there. Bit of F1 flavour. And Emma Gilmore is chatting to us next week, back rallying after that massive crash in Extreme E, another leading light for women in motorsport in this part of the world who works, as you'll hear, in automotive too. Oh, and an email just through. <laughs> we finally look like nailing down the goat. Ricky Carmichael, I've been promising that, I know. He's been away, and so have I. Keep an eye out for notifications on that in the weeks ahead. And don't forget the new addition to the Rusty's Garage offering, what we're doing around supercars events. I step back and just let the drivers take over the studio. It's called Drivers Only. It is fantastic. Different panel of drivers each time. They're all currently on the grid, and conversations that are unlike anything that you've probably listened to elsewhere. Search for it in our Garage Library at Listener or wherever you get your pods. That is it from me for today. Thank you for listening. It's good to be back. Bye for now.